So my tentative plan is to just kind of go through, I think I could get through all the questions on the review. Um, that was my tentative plan, but if there's any other suggestions that anyone has, feel free to shout those out in the chat box. And um, I am happy to go over anything that people want to talk about. But my tentative plan is to just go over the exam review, the one that is posted on um, Canvas. So we'll just start with uh, problem one, so which is finding the limits, and then it's writing plus or minus infinity or DNE as necessary. All right, so for the first one, and like I said, throw out any questions, comments, concerns, suggestions that you have in the chat box, I'm happy to talk about whatever we want to talk about. So let me, as x approaches 1 of x squared minus 5x plus 4 over x cubed minus x. So your first thought process when you're doing limit problems should be, can I plug the number in? Because oftentimes if you can plug the number in, then, you know, you're good to go. You know, you just plug it in and then you get an answer and you're good. Unfortunately, here we're going to get 1 minus 5 plus 4 is 0 on top and a 0 on bottom. So once again with the zeros, if you get 0 over 0, that means you need to use a trick. Oftentimes it's simplifying with algebra or multiplying by a um, conjugate, but you need to use a trick to simplify. If you get a number, a non-zero number over zero, that's when you need, you know it's gonna be plus or minus infinity and you need to decide which. So in this case, it's zero over zero. So that means we're gonna use a trick. And factoring is kind of the way you'd think to go with these ones. So if you see a rational uh, function, if you see a rational function and you get zero over zero, typically it's going to be factoring. Um, so there's a question in the chat box about the exam. I'm just a bit confused as to how to take the test. We print it, scan it, and then send it to you. Is there a time limit? Um, it has to be done. I just know it has to be done before Friday. Yeah. So it'll be posted on Canvas on Monday and then you'll print it, you'll take it and you'll scan it and then you'll upload it just like you upload your homework. And um, it just has to be uploaded before Friday. So um, it's not like I'm timing it or anything. It just needs to be completed and uploaded before Friday. You can start on Monday. And as long as it's uploaded before Friday at 11.59 p.m., you are good. if that answers that question. Yeah, no problem. All right, so factoring this guy up top, um, not plus, <laughs> x minus four, x minus one. On the bottom, I can factor out an x, and then I have an x squared minus one, which can be factored again. And notice my limit notation, I'm writing limit each time, so it's not optional to write the limit. Um, I will be making sure everybody's homework is graded by the end of today, so you'll have that graded so you can look at the comments from this homework and last homework. Um, but I will be marking down both on homeworks and the exam if you do not have the correct limit notation. So these x minus 1s are going to cancel here. We have the limit as x approaches 1 of x minus 4 over x times x plus 1. And now, because we canceled, oftentimes once you've canceled, that'll fix the 0 over 0 problem. So you can try plugging in again. So now we have 1 minus 4, and I drop the limit, right, because I'm no longer, um, I've plugged in x, so I don't write limit as soon as I plug in x. 
Um, and a question, so just to remember, in what occasion would you stop or not write the limit to the next, next to the problem? You would write the limit as long as you haven't plugged in one. So if you haven't plugged in this number, you would um, continue to write limit. So I stopped writing limit here because I plugged one in. And I stopped writing limit here because I plugged one in. But this still had x's in it, so I hadn't plugged one in yet. So I was still writing limit on this step here. Uh, excellent. So then I have 1 times 1 plus 1. So I have negative 3 over 1 times 2. Negative 3 halves. And that would be my answer for that one. Can I answer any questions on that one? All right, hold on just one second. All right, so let's go ahead and do problem 1B. So I have the limit as t approaches 3 of t squared minus t minus 6 over t squared plus 2t minus 15. Once again, always worth trying to see if we can just plug it in. So I'm going to plug 3 in and just see if it works. Never know. All right, so we're going to get 9 minus 3 is 6. 6 minus 6 is 0. On the bottom, 9 plus 6 is going to be 15, minus 15 is 0. So we are at a use a trick stage. I feel like my pen is normally bigger, but maybe I'll, maybe I'll use that size now. All right. So once again, if we're using a trick and you have a rational function, factoring is almost always going to be that way you want to go. See the limit as t approaches 3 of t plus 3. Nope, not plus 3. <laughs> t minus 3 times t plus 2. Ooh, I like the way that writes much better. On the bottom, we have t plus 5 times t minus 3. Right. So canceling out those t minus 3s, we have the limit as t approaches 3 of t plus 2 all over t plus 5. Once again, we can try plugging in. So we have 3 plus 2 over 3 plus 5. So we have 5 over 8. That is a number. So we can just stick with that. And that is our answer for that one. Can I answer any questions on that guy? If not, I will go ahead and go to the next page. And once again, this is being recorded, and so I will have it posted so you can come back later and look at it. If you're right now thinking like, oh, I haven't gone through the review at all, and I would like to try it for myself first, um, I think I am going to try to go through all the questions right now. So if you don't want to see the answers right now, if you just want to like try it for yourself first, like if you want to skip this, that's totally fine. Like I said, I'll have it posted later tonight anyway. So it will be available for you later if you don't want to see these answers right now. So just kind of throwing that out there just in case anybody's like, ooh, I kind of wanted to try for myself. All right, 1C. So I have the limit as t approaches 4 of the square root of t plus 5 minus 3 over t minus 4. Now, <laughs> you can kind of see this is going to be a problem immediately. Um, cause you see, it's going to be a zero on the bottom and you can kind of plug this in, in your head, right? You're, you're going to see if you plug in the four 
you get square root of 9 minus 3 over 4 minus 4. You're going to get 0 over 0, and it's use a trick time. Oftentimes, in calculus exams um, and calculus problems, it's going to be use a trick time. It's always worth trying to plug in because there are cases where it really is just plug in and then you feel really stupid when you try factoring and nothing cancels and then you're like, man, what's going on here? Like, why is nothing canceling? I must be doing something wrong when it was really like the problem was actually just so simple that you overthink it. So it's always worth trying just in case it is one of those. Wow, it's just super simple. Um, so just try. If you don't, if you go straight to the trick, I I'm not going to fault you. So I'm not going to mark you down for not trying it right away. Like if you don't do this part right here, it's okay. Um, I suggest doing it just in case I like throw an easy problem at you, you know, for, for free fun points. Um, but if you go straight for a trick, that's okay. You can, <laughs> you can do that. Um, there's no, there's no harm in doing algebra before plugging in. So just throw it out there. All right. Square root of t plus five minus three over t minus four. <clears throat> what trick are we thinking for this one? What trick would we think to do for this one? It has a radical in it. That should make us think some thoughts. Conjugate, I hear conjugate, I hear onjugate. Um, so it, it is right, it is conjugate. We will use the conjugate here. So um, the conjugate that you're multiplying by is going to be the conjugate of the radical, whatever the radical is. So here, we're just changing that sign in the in-between there. So instead of square root of t plus 5 minus 3, it's the square root of 5, uh, to, uh, square root of t plus 5 plus 3. Now, I want to kind of make a point here that if you had something like um, 4 minus, I don't know, 9 minus x over... I, 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 I don't know, x minus 2. I'm just making up numbers here. If you had something like this, the conjugate you'd be multiplying by would be 4 plus square root of 9 minus x, right? So it's wherever, wherever the radical is, it doesn't matter if it's in the denominator, the numerator, or the denominator. You're just taking that radical and you're changing that sign in the middle. So it doesn't matter if the radical is first or second, it's either way just going to be that middle sign in there. So, so yeah, there we go. All right. Here, because this is a difference of squares, the t plus 5s will multiply together, uh, the square roots, and you'll just get t plus 5. The middle terms will cancel. So you don't need to worry about the middle terms. And then you have that negative 3 and the positive 3, which multiply together to get, you know what, I'll just write minus 3 squared. On the bottom, it's really important that you remember to write the square root of t plus 5 plus 3. It's the easiest thing to forget to do. Still writing the limit this entire time because I haven't plugged anything in. Um, on top, it's going to be t plus 5 minus 9. So I'm not going to spend the step writing that down. I'm just going to go to t minus 4 on top because that's what it'll be. And I'm putting it in parentheses just because I know it's going to cancel. So I'd rather have it in parentheses because it looks nicer. but there's no mathematical reason for me to have put parentheses up here. Now, these t minus 4 is going to cancel. And I kind of want you to think about something at this point. All right, I'm going to go back a page, and I want you to think about something. Up here on this problem, because these all three of these problems are 0 over 0 problems, right? On this problem, the factor that canceled was x minus 1. Is that how you spell canceled? I don't know. It doesn't matter. Um, so x minus 1 canceled, and we were going to 1. x was approaching 1. 
down here. The T minus three canceled. Right, it canceled on top and bottom in both these cases, right? That's how things cancel. T minus three canceled and T was approaching three. Hmm. And then we come over here and it's the T minus fours that cancel. And T was approaching four. As it turns out, this isn't all um, coincidence at all. So maybe a fun fact, if you end up with zero over zero, when you go to cancel, like when you do the trick, after the trick is complete, whatever trick you use, you'll be canceling the factor Um, x minus c, where x approaches c. So in the case where you have a limit uh, as, let's say, t approaches negative 7, and you have stuff over stuff, and let's say you got 0 over 0, when you go do the algebra on this, right, there's going to be stuff, and you're going to get a t plus 7 on top stuff and a t plus 7 on bottom because c in this case is negative 7 so if you do x minus negative 7 x plus 7 or t plus 7 in this case so you get t plus 7's canceling is this something that's incredibly important to know no but you know where it does help with factoring because if you're looking at this and i mean yeah these are these are not hard to factor but if I know that x minus 1 has to be a factor on the top, you can factor this really quickly. It tells you what one of the factors are already. And if I know that t minus 3 has to be a factor, it's just one step closer, right? So something just to know. Plus, if I'm not here to give you fun calculus facts, what am I here for? I'm just useless otherwise. Onward with the problem we were actually doing. So now we have 1 over the square root of t plus 5 plus 3. We can try plugging in. So another thing to point out is after you've done the canceling of the x minus c factor, after you, uh, I see a question too, and I'm going to answer that question in just a second. Um, after you cancel the x minus c factor, so after you do this here, it almost always works. Almost always you'll be able to plug in. So there's a question in the chat box that says, so if you approach a negative number, it is a positive factor. Right. So if you have um, t approaching 3, we've already used 3, let's do 5. If you have t approaching 5, then you're going to see t minus 5s that cancel. But if you have t approaching negative 2, then you're going to get t plus 2s that cancel. Basically, what you're thinking of is that in order to get 0 over 0, there's a factor on top that when you plug this number in, gives a 0, right? So if you plug 4 in, this gives you a 0, and this gives you a 0, and that's where the 0 over 0 comes from. So here, plugging 5 into t minus 5 gives you 0. Plugging negative 2 into t plus 2 gives you 0, if that answers that question. No problem. No problem. Man, this gives me recall. Hold on, I'll pause. Sorry, people watching this on the review. I'm going to go off on a tangent real quick. So I'm just going to pause it so I can go off on a tangent and off that tangent. I mean, it's not much fun to listen to somebody talk on Zoom just about math, right? You got to have a few tangents in there. So plugging in. All right. So plugging in four, four plus five is... 9, so we have square root of 9 plus 3. Uh, that's going to be 1 over 3 plus 3, which is 6. So we have 1 sixth. Can I answer questions on that?
All right. Maybe I'll chunk this up and push cord. So if I chunk it up that way, if I need to go edit something back in later, it's easier. Okay. One D. Also, I don't know how long this review session is going to last. And as such, you don't need to stay for any given length of time. Um, my goal is to just kind of get through this entire review packet. Um, so if it goes long, you can just sign off. And if you want to stay the whole time, that's there. But it'll be posted later. Just once again, this will all be posted later. People watching this in the future are like, I get it. I'm watching it right now. Please stop talking about that. All right, Lemon, as Z approaches to, I miss being in the classroom. I miss people either laughing or not laughing at my jokes. And then if they don't laugh at my jokes, then I could say, it's okay, I'm laughing at my jokes because I know I'm funny anyway. And like, I don't know if anyone's laughing or not. And that's really hard. That's like the worst part of online teaching. Anyway, my husband and I had a long conversation about this. Thank you, Catherine. I appreciate you saying that you laughed. I appreciate eight of you, I guess, six of you, because two of the people are me, uh, joining me on a Friday to talk about math. I know you kind of have to because like you have a test and everything, but I appreciate you nonetheless. All right, we're going to try plugging in. You have a good idea that it's not going to work, but you know, we're going to do it anyway. And now I feel like I have to put one on there where it works out. I feel like I have to, because if I don't, then like, I'm telling you to, to just plug in, but you have no, no motivation. So, you know, I'm just going to throw out there that I might do that. You know, who knows? Anything could happen. All right. Plugging into three times two is six plus two minus one eighth over two minus two. You are going to get one eighth minus one eighth over zero, which is zero over zero, which is use a trick time. So everybody's favorite thing here, you have a complex fraction and you need to make it into a non-complex fraction. And I saw a lot of different ways that people did this. And I kind of want to talk about both ways that you can do this. So my favorite method is multiplying everything by the LCD. So I'm going to talk about that method first. So So the LCD, you're looking at the fractions within the fractions. So you're just looking at these guys because these are fractions within a big fraction. The LCD of these guys is 8 times 3z plus 2. So you're going to take this and you're going to multiply this big fraction by 8 times 3z plus 2 on the top and the bottom. Now, I saw this go wrong on a lot of homeworks, and I took off some points for this, because a lot of people would do this first step, and this first step is fine. But then things would kind of go wonky, and it's like some other math happened, which was valid math, but that math, didn't, that math doesn't follow from doing this. So if you're doing this step here, this entire thing is getting distributed both here and here. Now, I'm going to write a step down, but I'm going to like erase it to show you like it's not a necessary step. But I want to reaffirm the algebra that's happening. The algebra that's happening here is that the 8 and the 3z plus 2 are distributed on top of both. I'm going to move this 8 out front. They're distributed on both, and then these cancel. And I'm going to kind of, I'm going to move that step away, because you don't really write this step. This is what happens, but you don't really write this step. You go from here straight to this next step I'm writing right now, where you have an 8 left, minus... 3z plus 2 
over 8 times z minus 2 times 3z plus 2. Right, so you're not really writing this step here. You're going straight from here to here, but that's what it looks like. So you're eliminating those fractions altogether. And the way that that finishes itself out, right, so you have 8 minus 3z minus 2 over 8 times z minus 2 times 3z plus 2. All right. Now, something to think about right now, if we're thinking about, oh man, which of these factors is going to cancel because we know something's going to cancel, just thinking forward, if we're approaching 2, we know that it's going to be a z minus 2 that cancels. Just something we can think about, right? Um, and we get negative 3z minus 6. And you're like, well, that doesn't quite look like it cancels, but no problem, we can factor out a negative 3. And if you do, wait, plus 6, plus 6. <laughs> I was like, wait, what's going on here? <laughs> negative 3. So let me point out, 8 minus 2 is not negative 6. 8 minus 2 is indeed positive 6, just to be clear. Um, factoring out a negative 3, you're going to get z minus 2, 8 times z minus 2, 3z plus 2, these z minus 2s will cancel. We have the limit as z approaches 2, and yes, I do know it's annoying to write limit each time, but you're, you're in math now, you play by my rules and all of math's rules. This is, this is something any calculus teacher would be hard about. Um, you play by these rules. These are the rules you write limit each time. All right. Now that you've canceled, you are good to plug in, and we can stop writing limit. So negative 3 times 8 times 3 times 2 plus 2. Negative 3 over 8 times 8. Negative 3 over 64. All right, so that is one way of doing this. I personally think this is the better way. There's a lot of algebra in here, yes, but I think it's the faster way. But I kind of want to talk about the way that I saw a lot of people do it because there was a few people who did it right completely, showed the algebra completely correctly. But there's some people who not just some, there was quite a few people. So like if this happened to you, you were not alone where this step got written down, but then things kind of went weird from there. So the other method is um, combine fractions, then flip and multiply. So essentially, the idea is that you can combine, if you have a fraction, like, if you have a fraction A over B over C over D, to combine these together, this is a rule we learn about fractions pretty early on, you can do A over B and then flip the denominator and multiply by D over C. So dividing fractions is like multiplying by the reciprocal of the denominator. So you can do that, so you can combine this top fraction into one fraction and then move from there, and that's fine, but you have to show the proper algebra while you're doing that. So if I'm going to do that, typically the method people use is they do cross multiplication. So to do cross multiplication, you're multiplying these things, so 1 times 8, and then you're multiplying these things, so you put a minus sign in there, and then 1 times 3z plus 2. And then in the denominator, you have these guys. 
So you have 8 times 3z plus 2. And then if you're going to do this, make sure that your fraction line is really big because this is a baby fraction as part of a big fraction. So it's like you have a baby fraction up here and it's on top of a big fraction. So it's really important to know where that line is for the big fraction. And then the z minus 2 is still in the denominator here. So totally okay to do this. Just making sure that you're doing the appropriate, you know, algebra here. Um, then you get 8 minus 3z minus 2 over 8 3z plus 2. And then to do the flipping, um, let's use like pink or something. So if you want to use this rule right here, there has to kind of be a fraction in the denominator. So you would put it over 1. So you could multiply by the reciprocal of z minus 2 over 1, which is 1 over z minus 2. So the mistakes I saw here, I would have people doing this, but they would also write z minus 2 under here. But if you're doing this right here, you don't write this part here. right? You don't write the z minus 2 underneath if you've already taken care of it on the side. Um, and then this is going to come out just the exact same way. right? Um, this right here is going to turn into eventually negative 3 times um, z minus 2 over 8 times 3z plus 2. And then if you multiply these together because they're both in the denominator, z minus 2, then it comes out to the same problem. And you would follow it down to the end. Right. So I just wanted to talk about the algebra there. Um, both methods are valid. Just make sure you're showing the correct algebra for the method that you're using. Answer any questions on that one. All right. If you have questions, just type them. Feel free. Even if I've gone past it, I can always go back. It's no big deal. We're going to definitely try to get through these a little quicker. All right. The limit as. Theta approaches zero. Of sine two theta over nine theta. Hold on a sec, I just need to grab some water real quick. Okay, so this one, you kind of have to think back to some of the special limits that we talked about. As a reminder, we talked about the limit as theta approaches zero of sine theta over theta, that this was one. We also said that the limit as theta approaches zero of theta over sine theta was one, but we went even further on that. We went even further and we said that the limit as theta approaches zero of whatever, over maybe better to do this as like some number than theta, or let's do sine on top, sorry, let's do sine on top, sine of some number theta, and that same number theta was equal to 1. So for instance, if this was a 2 on top and bottom, that that would be 1. It could be like a 4 theta, 5 theta that that would be one. And then the same thing would be said, oops, one. Um, the same thing could be said if you flipped it upside down. So limit as theta approaches zero of a number theta over sine of that number. So again, something like three or like four, as long as it's the same number on top and bottom.
So this looks really close, but we would need this to be a two, right? If I wanted to use, oops, that moved too far over, didn't it? If we wanted to use this rule right here, it would need to be a two and a two. So this nine would need to be a two. So we need to do something tricky. And the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this nine and I'm gonna move him out front. Remember he's in the denominator. So when he comes out front, he's like a one over nine because he has to stay in the denominator. And then we have the limit as theta approaches zero of sine two theta over theta, which is still not enough for us to deal with, right? Because we do need to have a two down there. We need to have a two down here. And we can't just be like, ah, oh, yes, there's now a two. Excellent. Everything is fixed and there are no problems in the world. Um, we can put a two down there, but if you do something in the numerator, you have to also do it in the denominator. It was okay for us to take a nine and put it out front because we weren't introducing a new nine in the denominator. We were just moving the location of a nine. But if we're introducing a new two out of nowhere, we have to, you know, account for it by putting one in the numerator as well, because then you're not really putting in a two, you're just multiplying by one in a clever way. And here's what's gonna happen. This two will go in here. This two is gonna come up top. So now you have two over nine, limit as theta approaches zero of sine two theta over two theta. And this whole thing right here follows this rule right here. So this is just one. So you have two ninths times one. You don't need to write limit anymore because this whole thing right here is just equal to the number one. Two ninths times one. That's just two ninths. Questions, concerns? One F. We have the limit as X approaches negative three from the positive side of T plus seven over t squared plus 4t plus 3. So the first thing we're going to do, we're going to try plugging in. Negative 3 plus 7. And then on the bottom. So on top, you're going to get 4. And then on the bottom, you get 9 minus 12 plus 3. So you get four over zero. If it's a number over zero, it's either positive infinity or negative infinity and you need to decide which. So the answer is not positive and negative infinity. You can't just say, aha, answer, done. Um, it needs, it's one of the two. All right, you need to decide which of the two. Now, I want to make sure that you don't think that just because there's a plus sign here that it's going to be positive or negative infinity because I could go back to any of these problems and I could put a plus sign on all of these here and it would be the same problem. The answer of this problem or any of the problems that we've done so far would not have changed if I had it as a left or right hand limit. As it turns out, the limit exists. So the left and right hand limits are equal to one another. And the problem we're about to work on, you would get a different infinity. If, if I didn't have this plus here, then you would get, you'd have to check the left and right hand limits. And for this particular problem, you'd get a positive infinity on one side and a negative infinity on the other, and you would end up with a DNE. 
So needing to decide which, which we're going to do, um, positive or negative infinity. So plugging in negative three on top, that's going to be fine. Um, plugging negative three on the bottom, we have to be a little bit more careful. So let me kind of erase here. Let me factor it because factoring can make this a tiny bit easier. Nothing is going to cancel. That's not going to happen. But I'll show you how it's a little easier. All right. We have it factored. And I can plug in negative 3. So I have negative 3 plus 7. The one that I have to be a little bit worried about is this first factor here. So negative 3 but it's a little bit bigger than negative three. So I'm gonna put negative three positive, negative three from the positive side. So bigger than negative three, plus three. And then uh, negative three plus one. So the only reason I need to worry about this one having a plus there is that all these others aren't gonna be close. If I did negative three plus three, it would just give me zero, which wouldn't help me. But on these guys, it, it's going to give me a real number. That's not the problem. So we have to be careful with this factor because this is the factor where it's like, I'm not sure if this is positive or negative. So on the top, negative three um, times, or negative three plus seven, that's positive four. So that's a positive on top. On the bottom, if you take a number slightly bigger than negative three, like negative 2.9, and you add three to it, you get a positive number. So this guy right here is a positive. And then negative three plus one is a positive. Three positives make a positive. I mean, I guess I should technically have an arrow here because these aren't really equal because I'm just making mumbo jumbo, but you get a positive. So this limit, goes to positive infinity. Once again, kind of recapping, if you get a number over zero, that's when you need to decide which of the infinities it goes to. If you can factor, factoring makes it a little easier, so factor it. Plug in the number for all the factors where it comes out to be a clear number, and for the number where it would come out to be zero, for the factor where it would come out to be zero, then just manipulate it a little bit and um, you know, try a number slightly bigger or slightly smaller than the number, depending on if you're coming from the left or the right and determine based on how many positives and negatives you have, whether you have a positive or negative answer. Let's try another one of these. One, what are we on now? G. So we have to limit as P approaches one from the negative side, and we have five P plus three all over P minus one quantity cubed. All right. So plugging in, 5 times 1 is 5 plus 3 over 1 minus 1 is 0 cubed. We get a number over 0, which means it's going to be plus or minus infinity. We need to determine which of them it is. Right? This is already as factored as it possibly can be. And on the top, we know if we plug in 1, that we get 8, and 8 is a positive number. So we have a positive on top. And on the bottom, we have 1 minus, so a number slightly smaller than 1. So a number smaller than 1 minus 1 cubed. Right. So if you have a number smaller than 1, like 0 0.9 minus 1, this will give you a negative number. So you have a positive over a negative cubed. If you cube a negative, you're going to get a negative. Positive over a negative is a negative. 
So all in all, you'll get negative infinity for that. All right, 1h, the limit, and this one's a little tricky, the limit as b approaches 0 of sine 3b over tangent of 5b. So at first you might be like, hmm, well, we don't have anything about sines over tangents. And now would be the time to remember that you do, in fact, have trigonometry behind you. And that tangent of theta is equal to sine theta over cosine theta. Very important fact from trigonometry. So uh, let's use that. So the limit as b approaches 0. And sometimes we don't know where this is going to go, right? You might not know where this is heading, but it's a thing you can try. That's always the thing with, with um, calculus. You don't know where your path is leading you. But even having not thought about this problem, my thought process is, okay, there's a sine and a tangent down here. And I know tangent relates to sine and cosine. I know nothing is going to cancel directly because this one has a 3 on the three b on the inside. This one has a 5b on the inside. But at least I could convert it and see what does cancel or what not what does cancel, what it looks like. And if it looks like anything I've done before. So I have sine of 3b, and then on the bottom, tangent is going to be sine of 5b, because you keep the inside the same, over cosine of 5b. Right. Different ways, I mean, you could do the trick where you multiply by the reciprocal of the bottom, or you could just multiply the top and the bottom of the big fraction by cosine 5b. By doing this, you cancel out the fraction that's on the bottom. So you have the limit as b approaches 0 of sine 3b cosine 5b over sine 5b. Nothing cancels. All right, just to be clear, we cannot cancel these because this one has a 3 on the inside. Oops, that's not my pointer. This one has a 3b, this one has a 5b, so these signs do not cancel. However, you might remember we did have a problem that looked, it didn't have a cosine in there, but it did look like sine of a, like 3b over sine of 5b. It was something like this. We have this in our notes. Um, this, if you want to reference it, um, it was section 1.2, I'll write it down. Uh, 1.2 example, 1.2.8 part B. The problem that we have would, was the limit as Z approached zero of sine 2Z over sine 5Z. So we did have something very similar to this. What we ended up doing here, this whole thing ended up breaking down into two different special limits that we multiplied together. And if you can remember that you did this example, that makes working on this example a little bit easier. Essentially, what our goal is here is we want this to be um, three limits in a row being multiplied together. We want to have the limit as b approaches 0 of sine 3b over 3b times, um, let's see, sine, so 5b over sine 5b, and then the cosine part right? So cosine 5b out here. Because if this is, if we have it looking like this, we can give each of these their own limit. We can put the limit in here. 
and you can take those limits separately and multiply them all together. So ultimately, that's our goal. But let's kind of set it up so it looks a little bit more like that. So I can take sine 3b and I can put it over 1. And I can take sine of 5b and do 1 over that. And then I can do cosine of 5b. And I don't need to really put him over 1. If I wanted to, I could put him over 1, but it doesn't matter. Um, but I could, do that. I could do it like this, right? So um, now it's about introducing the pieces we're missing, which are the 3b and the 5b up here. Move this over. So to get the b's in there, I can multiply by b on top and bottom, right? b over b is fine. I could put one of the b's there and one of the b's there, and that would take care of that. To get rid of the 5 right here, I have to do it on top and bottom. So I'll do 5 and 5. Right? This 5 needs to go here so that you get a 5b. Right? So I can kind of like erase this. And I could write, instead of having the b here, I'll put the b here. Instead of putting the 5 here, I'll put the 5 here. And then down here, Oops. We know we want this B here, so this B's gone. We moved it. But we also need a 3, right? We need this 3 right here. So I'm going to multiply by 3 over 3. And I'm going to move this 3 straight here. What we do have left, right, we have this 5 and he's gonna have to move out front. Yeah. That five is gonna have to move out front. So now he's taken care of, he's out front now. And then this leftover three over here is gonna have to come up front as well. And now we've taken care of him. So everything we've multiplied in, we have now moved into a different place. So nothing that was over here, oops, it's not my pointer. Nothing that was over here is over there anymore. We've all moved it into place. And now these look like our special limits that a few slides ago we had talked about. In particular, these two. So what we have at this time is 3 over 5, limit as b approaches 0, and I'm going to split the limit up over all three of these. So I have the limit as b approaches 0 of sine 3b over 3b times the limit as b approaches 0 of 5b over sine 5b, and then the limit as b approaches 0, of cosine of 5b. And cosine of 5b is not a problem. We can plug in 0 for that. So what we know, this right here is 1. This right here is 1. So we have 3 fifths times 1 times 1. And then for this guy here, plugging in 0 for b, we have cosine of 0. And cosine of 0 is 1. So we have 3 fifths, 1 times 1 times 1. We have the answer of 3 fifths. It's a roundabout way. It's pretty long, right? It's long. It's complicated, but it gets you there. All right. I would stop and ask for questions, but I want to make sure we get through as many of these as possible. And it's going to take some time. So 
let's move on to one eye. These ones are going to start getting a little quicker now. The limit as n approaches infinity of n cubed plus 2n plus or minus 7 over 4n to the fourth plus n squared plus 2. In the case where you are approaching infinity or negative infinity and you have a rational function, again, only works, only, only, only works when you are approaching positive or negative infinity and you have a rational function. If this is a number, you can't do this. But in the case where you are approaching infinity and you have a rational function, you can eliminate everything but the highest power on the top and bottom. So highest power is n cubed on top. 4n to the fourth is the biggest on the bottom. So we have the limit as n approaches infinity of n cubed over 4n to the fourth. We can simplify this. So we have the limit as n approaches infinity of 1 over 4n. So plugging that in, 1 over 4 times infinity, that's... 4 times infinity is just infinity. 1 over infinity gives you 0. So those ones are nice and quick. All right. 1J. The limit as x approaches negative infinity of once again a rational function. So negative 37x to the 19 over or plus x cubed plus x minus 5 over negative 2x to the 19th minus x to the 18th plus 5x squared plus 9. Once again, approaching negative infinity. So anything that's not the highest power we don't care about. So you have the limit as x approaches negative infinity of negative 37x to the 19th over negative 2x to the 19th. Simplifying the 19th, x to the 19th cancel. So we have negative 37 over negative 2. Limit of a constant is a constant itself. The negatives cancel. And you just have 37 over 2. Probably have another room on the slide for this. Um, okay. The limit as z approaches negative infinity of negative 3z to the fifth plus 5z plus 1 over 4z cubed plus 2. Again, approaching negative infinity, so we can look at only the highest powers. So we have the limit as z approaches negative infinity of negative 3z to the fifth over 4z cubed. And we can simplify. So the limit as z approaches negative infinity over negative 3z squared over 4. So plugging in, we have negative 3 times negative infinity squared over 4. If you square negative infinity, that's going to be positive infinity. If you multiply negative infinity or negative 3 by infinity, so infinity times negative 3, that's just going to be a negative infinity. And dividing negative infinity by 4 isn't really going to do anything to it. It's just going to remain negative infinity. So if you had 4 over negative infinity, this would be 0. But negative infinity over 4 is negative infinity. 
because dividing negative infinity by four doesn't change how infinite it is. Whereas if you're dividing four by a very, very big negative number, it's just going to be zero. One L. This one is the limit as K approaches infinity of the square root of four K to the sixth minus seven K plus one over two K cubed minus one. So we are approaching infinity. And it does mean that we can get rid of anything that's not the highest power, right? Because we are approaching infinity. We just have to be a tiny bit careful with square roots. So we have the square root of 4k to the sixth over 2k cubed. Now, what you have to be careful of here is just the square root. So in general, what we can do is we can split up the square root and put it over the four and put it over k to the sixth. But you have to be careful to make sure that k to the sixth wouldn't become negative. But here's the thing, we're going to positive infinity. And if you put positive infinity to the sixth power, that's a positive number. What we wanna be careful of is if there's a negative under the square root, because if there's a negative under the square root, then we can't, then there's no limit there. The limit would DNE. But because it's going to be a positive number under the square root, it's okay for us to split it up like this. And if you split it up like this, you're going to get 2k cubed, right? Because the square root of k to the sixth is the same thing as k to the sixth raised to the one half power. And then you multiply those exponents. So you have k to the third. So the square root of k to the sixth is k cubed, which you can do as long as, as, long as your k to the sixth is a positive number. So the limit as k approaches infinity of now 2k cubed over 2k cubed, which all cancel out. We have the limit as k approaches infinity of 1, and the limit of a constant is just the constant itself. Next one, the limit as t approaches zero from the negative side of 17 over t cubed plus one over t. All right, so plugging in here, plugging in, 17 over zero cubed plus one over zero. So clearly this is some kind of infinity game, right? But here's the thing, we don't know, like, is this one going to plus or minus infinity? Because it's either going to positive infinity or negative infinity. And same with this one. And if, if they cancel each other out, we have to do tricks. So here's, here's the case that could happen. If you get infinity plus infinity, so if these were both positives, then you'd get the answer to be infinity. If they're both negatives, so negative infinity minus infinity, then the answer is negative infinity. But if you get two that, that contradict each other, so if you get infinity minus infinity, this requires a trick. It's not zero, it requires a trick. And if you get negative infinity plus infinity where it like quote unquote cancels each other out, you would also need a trick. So if it's one of these two cases, we're good. We just have to figure out which it is. So 17 is a positive number. And then if we take a number slightly less than zero and cube it, we have something there, plus one is a positive number, and then number slightly less than zero. So if you take a number slightly less than zero, that's going to be a negative number. And if you cube it, you're also going to get a negative. Plus, 
a number slightly less than zero is a negative. So here we have a positive over a negative plus a positive over a negative. And each of these are an infinity. Remember that. So each of these individually are representing an infinity. So positive over negative, that's going to be negative infinity plus positive over negative, negative infinity. That's the same thing as negative infinity minus infinity, which is luckily this situation right here raw, which is negative infinity. And we don't have to do a trick at all. So we are, we are good on that one. Right. Once again, feel free to jump in with your questions at any time. Um, I just trying to get through <laughs> as many of these, because I know we've gone on for an hour and 11 minutes right now. The good news is that number one is the longest problem and that the rest of them should not take nearly as long. Nearly as long. All right, the limit as u approaches infinity of 6u squared minus 4, the square root of 4u squared plus 5u minus 9. So this is kind of a weird one to do, right? Because it's not like the previous ones we dealt with where here it was like, okay, there, here we had like two different infinities and it was kind of clear what was going on. Um, each was its own fraction. Here we had a top and a bottom and then you cancel out the top and the bottom parts. Um, what's going on in this one is you don't have two different fractions. You have two different pieces and it's kind of unclear exactly what's going on, right? You have to be a little bit careful. We do know that the highest power is going to take precedent in general. So if this was a fraction at all, which, you know, it technically is, um, we know that for sure these guys won't play any role. We just have to make sure that this part right here, how it, how it compares to this piece here, who has a higher power. So we can cancel out these. That's no big deal because they're not going to take precedent in the long run because we're going to infinity. Now, because you have u squared here um, and we, we want to make sure that like, plugging in positive infinity is not going to be a problem. It's not going to be a problem. Um, also, because we're going to positive infinity, we don't need to worry about absolute value. So nothing weird is going to happen here. Um, we can just go ahead and take that square root. So we have 6u squared minus 2u. That's what the square root of 4u squared would be. Because... 2u is a lower degree. So we had to do this just to double check to make sure that this guy didn't compare to him. Because if they have the same degree, we would need to be careful about that. But, but because they don't compare, because this degree is lower, we don't have to worry about him. We can just eliminate him because he's not a higher degree. He's not the same degree, and he's not a higher degree. So we have 6u squared now. And then plugging in 6 times infinity squared, infinity squared is infinity, 6 times infinity, that's just going to give you infinity. Okay. 1, O. Oh. Almost done with these first ones. The limit as x approaches 5 of 2x over x minus 5 quantity squared. Now, looking at this, you can kind of tell what's going to happen because you're if you plug in, 2 times 5 is 10, and then you get 0 squared. 
So this is a plus or minus infinity in situation, but we're a little bit different because it's not a one-sided limit. So we have to make sure, we have to check the left and the right-hand limits. And we have to see like if one of three different situations happens. Um, so one, if both left and right limits equal positive infinity, then the limit equals positive infinity. Um, same idea if both equal negative infinity, then the limit equals negative infinity. In the third case, if one equals positive infinity and the other equals negative infinity, then the limit won't exist. So that's the situation we're in. We need to double check both limits from both sides and see if they are equal to one another. So we will try the left-hand limit first. So on top, if we plug in five, we're gonna get 10, which is a positive number. On the bottom, a number slightly less than five, minus five, and then we square it. So if you think about this, like 4.9 minus five, and then you square it, that's gonna be a negative number that gets squared. And if you square a negative number, like you're gonna get positive number. Now I'm not confident with my, my decimal math. I'm just going to say that this is positive. So you would get a positive over a positive. So the left-hand limit goes to positive infinity. Checking the right-hand limit. Positive on top. A number bigger than five minus five squared. Well, a number bigger than five, that would be like 5.1 minus five squared. So 0.1 squared, that's also positive. So you have a positive over a positive and that goes to positive infinity. So these are the same, they both go to positive infinity and because they both go to positive infinity, we know that the overall limit goes to positive infinity. And technically it's a form of DNE, right? Technically it's a form of DNE, um, but uh, we, if we can say positive or negative infinity, we always say positive or negative infinity. Last one of the ones, 1p. This is the limit as x approaches zero of sine x over the absolute value of x. And there's a little note that says, recall that the absolute value of x is a piecewise defined function that's x if x is greater than or equal to zero and negative x if x is less than zero. Now, because this is a piecewise defined function here, we can actually make this function into a piecewise defined function. So it would be sine x over x 
if x is greater than or equal to zero, right? Because I'm just using this top piece right here. And it would be sine x over negative x using the bottom piece if x is less than zero. So we can't just use our special rule that we used back here forever ago. Wow, really forever ago. We can't just use these special rules because this doesn't have an absolute value sign here. It would need to have an absolute value sign for us to be able to use that. So we have to make it into this piecewise defined function. And then we're going to have to check left and right limits because it is a piecewise function. So we'll check from the negative direction. So from the negative direction, that means we are less than zero. So we're using that piece. So it's the limit as x approaches zero from the negative side of sine x over negative x. Now this negative can really be moved around. So negatives are really malleable, right? Um, if you have one over negative two, this is the same thing as uh, negative one over two. It's the same thing as negative one over two. The negatives are really malleable. This negative can be moved out front. And now we have sine x over x. And this right here, this right here is a special limit. It doesn't matter that this is one-sided because in general, we know that the limit as x approaches zero of sine x over x is one. And if this is true, that means this implies the fact that this limit exists and equals one implies that if you approach from the negative side, it'll be one. And if you approach from the positive side, it'll be one. So we have a negative out front, this negative comes down, and then this is one. So that limit from the left side is one. If you look at the limit from the right side, so coming from the positive side of zero, we're now using this version, the top part, because we're greater than zero. So this is just sine x over x. And uh, that one's just flat out one. And now we have the left and right hand limits, which are not equal, right? One of these is negative one and the other one is positive one. So we say that the limit as x approaches zero of sine x over the absolute value of x does not exist because their left and right limits are not equal. So overall answer is it does not exist. Ah, now we're done with one, finally. <laughs> it took a while, but we are done with it. So the rest of them should go much, much quicker than one. All right. So this question says to determine the values of k such that the following limit exists. So we have the limit as x approaches 2 
of k squared, right, this is a k, k squared x squared minus 30x minus 8k over 3x squared minus 5x minus 2. What we want to do here is figure out what the problem is, all right? We want to figure out the problem is, and in order to do that, we just need to plug 2 in and see what happens. Once we plug 2 in and see what happens, we'll have a better idea of what we need to do going forward. Remember, when you plug in 2, you are only plugging 2 in for x. You're not plugging it in for k. So if you see a k, it doesn't go in there. It only goes in the x's. So we have k squared times 2 squared minus 30 times 2 minus 8 times, oops, not k, not, not 2, but k. On the bottom, we have 3 times 2 squared minus 5 times 2 minus 2. So we have 4k squared minus 60 minus 8k all over 12 minus 10 minus 2. So we have 4k squared minus 60 minus 8k over 0 when we plug it in. So here's the situation. There's two things that could happen here. If the numerator does not equal zero, then you have a number over zero and it will go to positive or negative infinity, which is technically a DNE situation. Right, technically a DNE situation and that's not what we want. If the numerator equals zero, that means you have a zero over zero situation where you can use a trick. And then sometimes, most of the time, by using a trick, you end up with an actual answer. Regardless of what we do, the denominator will be zero, right? If we plug it in, the denominator is going to be zero if we plug in two. So we need that numerator to equal zero as well so that we're in this situation and not in the situation where it goes to positive or negative infinity. So 4k squared, I'm going to rewrite this, 4k squared minus 8k minus 60 needs to be equal to zero. We can factor out a 4 here, right? k squared minus 2k minus 15 equals zero. Right? This can be factored. So k minus 5 times k plus 3 equals 0. The k's that we can plug in here are k equal to 5 and k equal to negative 3. We need to make sure, though, right? We need to make sure that um, this all works out according to plan. So what we can do, um, we can take them and we can plug them back into the original to just double check them. We can plug them back in here and here. So hypothetically, right, we're saying k equals 5 and k equals negative 3 should work. But that we should check them to be ultra sure that this is right. So if we say k is equal to 5, then we have the limit as x approaches 2. 5 squared is 25. Oops, what am I doing? <laughs> 25 x squared minus 30x minus 40, because that would be if I plugged in k, 5, be 40, all over 3x squared minus 5x minus 2. All right, so I'm going to use my calculator for this one. I'm not going to write it down. So if I plug that in, we have 25 times plugging in 2, 2 squared, minus 30 times 2 minus 40, I do get 0, so I get 0 over 0, which should mean to use a trick, 
So let's, let's solve it the entire way out. You should factor it, right? So the limit as x approaches 2. On top, I can factor out a 5. So I have 5, 5x squared minus 6x minus 8. Um, on the bottom, technically x minus 2 should be a factor. That's something we kind of talked about earlier. And if x minus 2 is a factor, here's the trick. If x minus 2 is a factor, then, and you're going to double check it afterwards, then to get 3x squared, you would have to have a 3x here, right? 3x times x. And then in order to get a negative 2 at the end, this would have to be a positive 1. And then you just double check it by doing it in your head. So you get 3x squared, and then and you have negative 2 in the middle, you would have x minus 6x, that would be negative 5x. And then you can factor the top in the same way, kind of being tricky there. You know x minus 2 has to be a factor, which leaves 5x plus 4 as the other factor. Once again, the way I'm doing that is just if it multiplies to 5x squared minus 6x minus 8, the first two have to multiply to 5x squared. The last two have to multiply to negative 8. And then double checking it, you have 4x minus 10x. That is negative 6x there. These x minus 2s cancel. You would be ready to plug in 2 now. So 5 times 10 plus 4 all over 6 plus 1. Right, so... 5 times 40 divided by 7, you get 200 over 7, which is a limit that exists. Right? So k equals 5 is good. Doing the same check on k equals negative 3. The limit as x approaches 2, plugging in to our original function, so Negative 3 squared is 9, so we have 9x squared minus um, 30x. Now, it's, it's minus 8k, so minus 8 times negative 3 is going to be plus 24. So plus 24. And then the bottom stays the same, so I can just keep its original, its factoring that I found. So x minus 2 times 3x plus 1. There's a common factor I can take out on top first. So there's a common factor of 3. So I have 3x uh, minus 10x plus 8 over x minus 2 times 3x plus 1. All right, we know that x minus 2 has to be a factor. So I guess what I should have done is uh, plugged in to show you that. So if you plug in 2 up here, 9 times 2 squared minus 30 times 2 plus 24, you do get 0. So this would come out to be 0 over 0. I, I should have done that first, but I didn't. Um, and then this will factor into 3x plus 4. Both of these cancel, plug in 2, you get 3 times 6 plus 4 over 6 plus 1, 30 over 7, which is a real value, so both of these work. It is important to double check your work though, just in case something had gone wrong along the way. So once again, the steps, um, 10 times 40, uh, so someone's saying 5 times 10 plus 4. What did I do in my head? Oh, I did 10 times 4 in my head. Good call. Good call there. This number is wrong. What did I do in my head? Two times. That's okay. Yeah, I think I, I think what I did is I literally multiplied them all together. Thanks for catching that. Yeah. So um, 10 plus 4 is 14, not 40, which I think is what I did. 40 times 5 would have been 200. Yeah. Yeah. 70. Okay, cool, 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 cool. So if you did this actually right and you did math right, thank you for catching that. 
This would be 70 over 7, and that would be 10. It doesn't change the legitimacy of the answer, but it is important to have that math right. Um, so once again, the idea of having a limit exist just means that you're not going to get a number over zero. You're looking for, in this case, because we knew the denominator would come out to be zero, you are looking for a zero over zero situation. So you're using that information to take this numerator, set it equal to zero, find the k values that work, and then double check those k values in the end to make sure that they actually work. Excellent. For number three, for what values of A will the following limit equal zero? And we have the limit as n approaches infinity of n to the a plus 32n minus 5 over n to the 5 minus 16n squared plus n plus 100. All right, so let's kind of think about this. If we were to have, um, th there's a few situations that could happen because we don't know if a is going to be a positive power or not. So it could be a negative power. You could have n to the negative a, a negative one, and a could be negative one. It could be negative seven. It could be a negative number here. It would make it not no longer a rational function, right? Um, but you could have a negative number. Um, so we have two kind of cases, and it's about whether a makes it a bigger power or not. So let's start with the case where, because we're looking at, and the reason I'm saying this is because we're going to infinity, right? We're going to infinity, so we only care about the highest power. So if A is greater than one, right, then it means it's the highest power on top. Then N to the A is highest power on top. So we would eliminate everything except for n to the a over n to the 5. So just kind of thinking about this, you kind of have to do, this is, this is not a real algorithm type problem. This is a thinking type problem. If A is equal to five, then you're gonna get N to the five over N to the five, which is one. Right, you'll get the limit as N approaches infinity of N to the five over N to the five, which will be one. And that's not zero, and we want the limit to be zero. All right, so um, it can't be five. And if it's bigger than five, like if you try six instead, the limit as n goes to infinity, you'd have n to the six over n to the five. Right? And then this would come out to be the limit as n approaches infinity of just n, which would be infinity, which is also not zero. So if you have Ooh. Um, if you have n a being bigger than five, equal to five or bigger than five, any number bigger than five, you're going to run up with, with infinities, right? So it can't be bigger than five. It can't be five itself. We can determine that right now.
or equal to five, bigger to five or equal to five. However, any number that's less than five, you're gonna end up with, with it simplifying to some, to a, it's gonna simplify to go to zero. So like if we try any number less than five, So, for instance, if we try the limit as n goes to infinity of n to the fourth over n to the fifth, then you're going to get 1 over n, which is 1 over infinity, which is 0. Right? So any number less than 5, and this works with 4 and a half. You could use 4 and a half and you'd run into the same situation. You could use... 4.999 and you run into the same situation, it's going to go to zero. Any number less than five should work. And we did say this was the situation where a is greater than one. But if a was equal to one, then you would have that these two combined together and became the highest term, but you're still going to simplify where the denominator is going to be bigger and you're going to go to zero. So in any situation, as long as the power on top is less than the power on bottom, you're going to go to zero. So the answer to this is as long as a is less than five, the limit will go to zero. Why is that not scrolling? Okay. Okay. Um, uh, you know, with number four, I feel like we did a lot of examples in our notes. I'll do it anyway. It's okay. So with this one, you're going to be told that the limit as X approaches two of F of X is equal to seven the limit as x approaches 2 of g of x equals negative 2, and the limit as x approaches 2 of h of x is equal to 1. And you're asked to find the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x plus g of x minus 10 over the square root of h of x plus 3 plus f of x squared. And here's where we get to use all those rules about limits that we had. So this limit, this let's say that, um, no, it just says that f, g, and h are functions. So with this guy right here, you can use all those rules from like the very first section where we're allowed to split that limit up. So I can give this limit to the numerator. And the denominator. And you can further distribute that limit inside. So you can give that limit to everybody. So you have the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x plus the limit as x approaches 2 of g of x minus the limit as x approaches 2 of 10 all over the limit as x approaches 2 of the square root of hx plus 3 plus the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x squared. 
You can further move that limit inside of, we talked about doing this, you can move the limit inside of the square root and you can move it inside of a square. So you have the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x plus the limit as x approaches 2 of g of x minus the limit as x approaches 2 of 10 and then the square root of the limit as x approaches 2 I'm going to I'm just going to skip to doing I'm giving it to both of them because you would get to do that in your next step anyway and I'm not going to make it that many more steps um, plus the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x and that whole thing is squared let me go back up to the top and grab these because otherwise I'm going to All right, I'm going to put those right there so I have some have it nearby. Um, there we go. Beautiful. All right, color coding them. Purple, green, blue. So this limit right here is 7. Right? This limit right here is negative 2. The limit of a constant is just the constant itself, so that's 10. The, this limit is 1, just right from here. Limit of a constant is the constant itself. And this limit is 7. So we have 7 plus negative 2 minus 10 over the square root of 1 plus 3 plus 7 squared. So on top we have 5 minus 10 which is negative 5. On the bottom the square root of 4 is 2 plus 7 squared is 49. So we get negative 5 over 51 as our final answer there. Start recording again, add saved photo. All right. So question five has this picture, has this love technology, has this picture. Um, for part A, there's three parts to part A. Part one is to find the limit as x approaches negative five from the negative side of f of x. So approaching negative five from the negative side Looks like we're going off to positive infinity. Let's color code that there. Does that want to be positive infinity? The next one is the limit as x approaches negative infinity of f of x. So going off to negative infinity, so going off the graph, but going to the left. Looks like there's a horizontal asymptote there, so that seems to level off. The y values appear to level off at 2. So this would be 2. Part 3 asks for the limit as x approaches negative 2 of f of x. So if we approach negative 2 from the left, we're approaching the y value 2, and same thing from the right, we approach the y value 2. So from either side, we approach the y value 2. So that limit is 2. And then part 4 is the limit as x approaches 6 of f of x. And if we're approaching 6 from the left, we approach 0, the y value 0. 
from the right, we're approaching the y value 2. Since those y values do not agree, that limit does not exist. Part B asks for where it's discontinuous and to explain mathematically why it's discontinuous. So just kind of looking, if I'm tracing it, I'm tracing it, oh, if I want it to be continuous, I would have to be able to trace it, but I have to stop tracing it at negative five, right? That's an area where I have to stop tracing it. Right, start tracing it, I can trace again. Oh, there's a hole in the graph. So that's an issue right here at negative two. Tracing it, tracing it, tracing it. Okay, so it looks like it breaks up again here at one. Tracing it, tracing it, no holes, no holes, no holes. Oh, breaks up again, I can't keep tracing it there. So there's another issue here. And then if I continue tracing it, I can trace it all the way off the graph. So it looks like there's four problems, right? The problem at five is that these limits aren't the same. They don't approach the same, the same place. So for x equals negative five, the problem, it's discontinuous because the limit as x approaches negative five of this function doesn't exist. And remember, the three things to being continuous, continuity, that doesn't look like it's spelled right, I'm just gonna go with it, requires one, f of c exists, two, the limit as x approaches c of f of x exists. And most importantly, three, the limit as x approaches c of f of x is equal to f of c. So there's the three requirements of continuity. So if the limit doesn't exist, then you're discontinuous. Our next value was at negative two. Now negative two, that limit did exist. Remember we said the limit was two. The limit exists and f of c exists, right? F of, f of negative two is negative three. So f of, f of negative two exists, they, it exists. The problem is this one here. They're not equal. The limit was equal to two, but the actual value is equal to negative three. So the problem here is that the limit as x approaches negative 2 of f of x is not equal to f of negative 2. The other two, so looking at um, 1, at 1, that limit doesn't exist. Those go off in completely different directions. So I'm going to kind of move this guy because I'm going to add to him. So same problem five had at one and same problem over here at six. That limit doesn't exist. So at negative five, one and six, we have the problem that the limit doesn't exist. And at negative two, we have the problem where the limit is not equal to the actual value at that point. Part C says to find uh, the limit as x approaches 8 of f of x minus x over 7. Right. So what we can do here we can go ahead and distribute the limit. Right? 
right? We can distribute the limit to everything and get the limit as x approaches 8 of f of x minus the limit as x approaches 8 of x over the limit as x approaches 8 of 7. For the limit as x approaches 8 of f of x, this part right here, we can go to the graph, right? So the limit from either side looks like it's approaching the y value 6. So that's 6. Um, if you're approaching, if x is approaching 8 and you just have the limit x, you just plug in 8 for x. And then the limit of a constant is the constant itself, which is 7. So of negative two over seven, and that would be my final answer. Number six. Find the limit as x approaches 2 of g of x, where g of x is this function x squared plus x minus, oops, messy, plus x minus 5 if x is greater than or equal to 2, and then it's 3x minus 7 if x is less than 2. So once again, you are doing left and right hand limits with piecewise functions. So approaching two, right? Um, we're trying to find this limit, so we need to do both directions. So we'll do the limit as x approaches two from the negative side of g of x. If we're less than two, we're using this bottom piece. So that's the limit as x approaches two from the negative side of three x minus seven. Plugging in two, 3 times 2 minus 7, that'll be negative 1. So it's negative 1 if we come from the negative side. Coming from the positive side of 2, if we're bigger than 2, we're using the top part of the function. So we're looking at x squared plus x minus 5, plugging in 2. So 2 squared plus 2 minus 5. So 4 plus 2 is 6, minus 5 is positive 1. If the left and right hand e uh, limits aren't equal, that means that the limit does not exist. Because the left and right hand limits are not equal. For seven, it's determining the values of x for which the function k is discontinuous. So we have k of x is equal to 2x plus 1 if x is less than 0. And if anyone needs to get going at any point in time, I know this has gone on for a while, it will be posted online. So if you do need to go, I take no offense to that. Um, it will be posted. If you want to be here watching it, totally fine. I would be recording it anyway. Um, but just know that I, you are not required to be here. Okay. So we're almost there. <laughs> this function here, we want to determine where it is discontinuous. 
So remember that there was a few steps to doing this. The first step is looking at each individual piece and finding out where each individual piece is, is discontinuous. So first piece, so of our step one, Um, the first piece, 2x plus 1, that's a polynomial, so that's continuous everywhere. So that's continuous everywhere. x squared minus 5 is also a polynomial. So same thing, continuous everywhere. 3 over x squared minus 2x minus 3 is continuous as long as the denominator doesn't equal 0. So if we factor the denominator, we have x minus 3 times x plus 1. So x cannot be equal to 3, and x cannot be equal to negative 1. If it's equal to either of those numbers, it'll be discontinuous there. But keep in mind, we only use this piece if x is greater than or equal to 2. So negative 1 won't be a problem because we would never use this piece of the function. If we, if we were using negative 1, we would go to this piece and we'd plug in negative 1 there and negative 1's not a problem. So it's only 3 that's going to be a problem. So we're going to circle 3 because 3 is a problem. We know we're discontinuous at 3. That was the first step. The second step is to check those breaking points places where the function breaks up. The function breaks up at 0 and at 2. Those are the places where the function breaks. So we'll try to, uh, 0 first. And you're checking the left and right hand limits to see if they're equal. If they're equal, then they're continuous there. If they are not equal, then it's discontinuous there. So we have the limit as x approaches 0 from the negative side of k of x. That's using the bottom part of the, or sorry, the top part of the function. So we're using 2x plus 1. If we plug in 0, we get 1. If we come from the top part of 0, we're using that middle piece. So x squared minus 5. 0 minus 5 is negative 5. So we don't need to go any further than this because we can. the limit doesn't exist. We know it's discontinuous there. The limit as x approaches 0 of k of x, dNe, which means we are discontinuous at x equals 0. So I'm going to circle this guy as well. Right? We're circling the discontinuities. We don't need to go any further. We know it's discontinuous at x equals 0. The next one is going to be at 2. That's the next breaking point, so we want to check those guys. So the limit as x approaches 2 from the negative side of k of x. 2 from the negative side means we're using this middle piece here. So x squared minus 5. Plugging in 2, you'll get 4 minus 5 is negative 1. Then the limit as x approaches 2 from the positive side. We're using that bottom piece there. So that's 3 over x squared minus 2x minus 3. Plugging in 2, so 4 minus 4 minus 3. We get negative 1. Okay, cool. So the, that limit exists, right? The limit as x approaches 2 of k of x is equal to negative 1. In order for it to be continuous, if we go back a few, so we have this guy right here. We just need to make sure that the actual value exists and that they are equal to the uh, value of the limit. So we want to check k of 2. So k of 2, you'd go for where it has the underline here. So you plug into that last piece is 3 over 2 squared minus 2 times 2 
minus 3, right, which we just did. That's 3 over negative 3, which is negative 1. So k of 2 is equal to negative 1. So kind of putting that all together, the limit as x approaches 2 of k of x is equal to k of 2. So we are continuous at x equals 2. So it's not a problem. So he's not part of our answer. Because this problem, in particular, wanted the discontinuities, right? Just the discontinuities. So all we are interested in are the discontinuities. We know we're good at 2. We're not good at 0 and 3. So the answer to this problem is that we are discontinuous at x equals 3 and 0. So even though we had to do more work for that last one, it's not part of the answer because you're actually continuous there. And the question is, where are we discontinuous? All right, we are getting to the end here. Question eight has two parts. Um, both both of them are asking for the intervals of continuity. Um, so we have f of x is equal to the square root of 2x plus 3. Nope, minus 3. Minus 3 all over x squared minus 16. And like most functions that we deal with that aren't piecewise functions, it's continuous on its domain. So you need, this is continuous on its domain. So that means you need to find domain. So a few issues. Remember, you can't have a negative under a square root. You can't have a zero in a denominator, and you can't have a negative or a zero on the inside of log. There's no logs here. Don't need to worry about that. Um, for the square root, we can't have a negative inside the square root. So that means that 2x minus 3 needs to be greater than or equal to zero. It's okay if it is zero, because the square root of zero is zero, that's fine. It needs to be greater than or equal to zero. So we have 2x is greater than or equal to three. X is greater than or equal to three halves. So that's part of our restriction. Our next restriction is no zero in denominator. Right, so that means that x squared minus 16 cannot be equal to 0. This is the difference of squares, x plus 4, x minus 4, not equal to 0. So x cannot be equal to negative 4, and x cannot be equal to positive 4. And then you take all that and you put it together. I like to draw number lines for this. makes it a little bit easier. So drawing a number line. I know my bare, my bare minimum restriction is that I have to be greater than or equal to three halves, right? So um, I have to be greater than or equal to three halves. From here, it says you can't use negative four, but negative four would be back here anyway, and I couldn't use negative four anyway because x had to be greater than or equal to three halves. So like basically that restriction is useless because we've already decided that we're not including negative 4 based on this guy. Next is that x can't be equal to 4. And 3 halves is, is 1.5. So 4 is definitely bigger. So 4 would be somewhere in here, and we can't include him. So our domain in general, in, which is our interval of continuity, is 
starts at three halves, goes to four, we take four out because we can't have four included, and it goes to infinity. And that is our interval of continuity. So I'm going to cheat a little bit and copy that part so I don't have to write it again for 8b. Find intervals of continuity of the function g of x equals, no, let's, let's move that down here. g of x equals ln of x cubed minus 11x squared plus 28x. So for LNs, the inside of logarithms, which LN is a logarithm, must be strictly greater than zero. All right, so like the inside must be strictly greater than zero. Here's what's really important when you set this up. Some people want to say ln x cubed minus 11x squared plus 28x greater than zero. And that would be wrong. That would be very wrong. Incredibly wrong. It might not seem like it's different to you, but mathematically what you're saying here is just it does not mean the same thing. LNs can come out to be negative. It's the inside part that can't be negative. So LNs are continuous on their domain, um, which is why we're able to find continuity this way. So we take the inside and the inside only, and we set that greater than zero. Not greater than or equal to, just greater than. This is a nonlinear inequality, and we need to set up a sign chart for it. So we'll factor, find our zeros, and then set up a sign chart. I can factor out an x, and then I get x squared minus 11x plus 28 greater than 0. Okay. x minus 7, x minus 4 greater than 0. So we'll get the zeros of x equals 0, x equals 7, x equals 4. Make a number line, and we use all those numbers. So we have 0, 4, 7, making sure they're in numerical order. And we take test values like negative 1, 1, 5, and 8. And we're taking those test values and we're plugging them in for each of the factors here to see if they're positive or negative. So negative 1, if you plug it into x, that's just negative. Negative 1 minus 7 is negative. And negative 1 minus 4 is negative. Three negatives make a negative. Plugging 1 in, 1 plugged into x is just 1, so positive. 1 minus 7 is negative. 1 minus 4 is negative. Two negatives make a positive. Plugging 5 in, so 5 plugged into x is positive, 5 minus 7 is negative, 5 minus 4 is positive, 1 negative makes a negative. Plugging 8 into x, 8 is positive, 8 minus 7 is positive, 8 minus 4 is positive, 3 positives make a positive. If you're greater than or equal to 0, you're looking for the positives. Greater than or equal to 0 means looking for positives. If you're strictly greater than zero, it means you're putting open circles here and just coloring in the areas where you are positive. So we know we are continuous on the interval zero to four, union seven to infinity. So with the logarithms, you are setting up a sign chart 
if it if it's a nonlinear inequality on the inside sign chart factor it find the zeros sign chart look for the positive places my voice is going out so we have two left um thank goodness because my voice is going out all right um nine Find a constant d such that the function below is continuous everywhere. We have the function p of x is equal to dx squared minus 3x and then ln x minus 1 plus 6. Uh, the top one is if x is less than 2 and the bottom one is if x is greater than or equal to 2. All right. So first of all, in terms of continuity, LNs are problems if you have a zero on the inside or a negative number. But since this part is only being used if x is greater than 2, you're not going to have a zero or a negative in there. So that's not a problem at all. So the only thing we're really looking at is this breaking up point. So we want to check those left and right hand limits. This is basically the moral of the story for piecewise functions and limits um, and continuity. Check the left and right hand limits at the breaking points and see if they're equal make them equal. So we'll check the limit as x approaches 2 from the negative side of this function p of x. From the negative side, we are using that top part. So dx squared minus 3x. When you plug in 2, remember, you're only plugging in for the x and not for the d. So we have d times 2 squared minus 3 times 2. So that gives me 4d minus 6, right? And then we can check from the upper end. So using the bottom part of the function, so ln of x minus 1 plus 6, plugging in 2 here, ln of 2 minus 1, so ln of 1 plus 6, um, ln of 1 is just going to be 0. And uh, so 0 plus 6 is 6. So in order for the limit as x approaches 2 of p of x to exist, we need those left and right hand limits to be equal. The limit as x approaches 2 from the negative side has to be equal to the limit as x approaches 2 from the positive side, i.e., this guy and this guy have to be equal. 4d minus 6 has to be equal to 6. Adding 6 on both sides, 4d is equal to 12. d has to be equal to 3. So if d is equal to 3, they should be equal. Um, and if you just double checked it, right, because we've done all the work here, if you plug in 3 for d, you get 12 minus 6 is 6, and then the left and right hand limits are equal. I think a lot of times these ones look like they're a lot harder than they are, but a lot of it is just left hand limit, right hand limit, set them equal, make it happen. So this one is going to be, the next one is going to be, the last one is going to be the same question sort of. So problem 10, last but not least. Except for instead of d, it's going to be c. And the function is a three-piece function. It's cx plus c squared if x is less than negative 3, it's 4. If x is equal to negative 3, 
and it is 5 ninths x squared plus c if x is greater than negative 3. Oof, almost there. So in terms of continuity in each piece, each of these are polynomials, so they're continuous everywhere. So we only have to worry about where it breaks up, much like the last one. And even though there's three pieces here, it actually only breaks at one point, and that's at negative 3. Now, I guess something that I didn't say back here is that once this limit existed, we technically had one more step to go, which was the limit needed to exist, and it needed to be equal to P of 2. P of 2, you would use this piece to plug in. Right? You'd have ln of 1 plus 6 is equal to 6. So you'd get that the limit was equal to 6, that p of 2 was equal to 6, um, that they were equal. That was our third requirement, right? But it kind of came easy from this one since it was included in one of the sides. It's a little different here since we're going to have a different value at negative 3 since there's this little middle piece here. But same idea of checking that, that breaking point where we check the left and right hand limits. That's where we start. So we have um, negative 3 from the negative side. So from the negative side, we have cx plus c squared. Plugging in negative 3, we have c times negative 3 plus c squared, which is negative 3c plus c squared. From the right, we're using the bottom piece, and that's 5 ninths x squared plus c. Plugging in negative 3, we have 5 ninths times negative 3 squared plus c. 5 ninths times 9 is going to be 5 plus c. So we need these to be equal in order for that limit to exist, right? But you're going to see that's not going to be enough right yet. So we need negative 3c plus c squared to be equal to 5 plus c. But that's not, there's not enough to solve for c here. Or is there? I don't know. It doesn't come out straight to c. There's a few things you can actually do here. All right. It doesn't look like you can solve for C, but we can move everything to one side, right? I can subtract 5 on both sides. I can subtract C on both sides. And when I do that, I'm going to get, so you're going to have C squared minus 4C minus 5 equal to 0. This is a quadratic, and we can factor this. We can totally factor this. So this is C minus 5 and c plus 1 equal to 0, so you get c equal 5 and c equal negative 1. So I said this isn't enough for to, to solve for c because only one of these is a right answer. Right? Only one of these is a right answer. We need it to be such that the limit is equal to 4. So f of negative 3 is equal to 4. And that's what we need the limit to be. We need the limit as x approaches negative 3 from the negative side, not from the negative side, just in general, to be f of to be 4. We need the limit as x approaches negative 3 of f of x to be 4. So we, we need to figure out which of these is going to make the answer 4. Well, if I take c equal to 5 and I plug it in, right, negative 3c plus c squared, so I get negative 3 times 5 plus 5 squared, so negative 15 plus 25, I get 10 which is not equal to, to, to f of 3, which is 4. We need it to be 4. 
right? So five isn't going to work. Trying out negative one, negative three C plus C squared, negative three times negative one plus negative one squared. So we have three plus one, that's four. Then we have to try out five plus C. So five plus negative one, that's four. So C equal to negative one is the only one that works because if you use five, you end up with the, li with the actual limit. So one second, let me write it down. If C equals five, then limit as x approaches negative three of f of x will be 10, which means f of negative three is not equal to the limit as x approaches negative three of f of x, because this was four. So you wouldn't be continuous. and we want it to be continuous. So C equals one is the, negative one is the only one that works because it makes sure that when you get the limit, so the limit here would be four, that the limit is the same as the value of the function at that point. And that is two and a half hours of talking there. So are there any questions? I desperately need my voice to have a break. Um, thanks for staying the entire time. I'm not sure why you would stay the entire time, but thank you for doing so. Um, so um, are there any, what is my, my thing is doing a really weird thing where it's like zooming in instead of scrolling. I don't know why. Huh. Um, any questions for anybody before I just call it good?